In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we are grateful to be called as part of your great big worldwide family to gather in your name and open the sacred scriptures today. And as we study this letter of St. Paul to the churches in Galatia, we ask that the, the saints in heaven that perhaps came into the kingdom because of his preaching there pray for us, and that St. Paul, you yourself pray for us. We rely on your intercession and the power of God's Holy Spirit to lead us into a fruitful study that all we might say and read and think, perceive and decide on will be truth, and that you'll plant it deep in our hearts to bring about good fruit in our lives. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. I, I was telling the group, some of you weren't here yet before we studied, that a week or so ago, uh, a fellow named Andrew from Australia contacted me and said that they were watching our YouTubes down there. And we wanted to permission <laughs> permission to... Uh, use some of them in a, in a Matthew study that he was going to edit and put together. And I said, of course, but I just wanted to share that with you because it was very, uh, uh, I love the idea that the family of God is being drawn together in that way and by our humble efforts here. And so we just want to say on behalf of the good people in South Georgia, hey, y'all, Andrew and his friends. And I'm sure they're saying good day, mate, back to us. That's great. Right. So uh, another thing he pointed out to me is I never date the studies and I never tell anybody who I am. So I guess I'm Deacon J. Dallas and this is October of 2017. And what we're going to do is a study of Galatians. And uh, I think it will take us six, seven, eight weeks perhaps. It usually does. We've done the study a couple times before. For your use at home, and I hope that you embellish our time here with some study at home, I recommend one of these two. We've used them both before, and I have some copies of each of them. And one is from the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. We've used them frequently. We now have the big print version of it, which is a blessing. And then this, which I enjoyed very much, we used a long time ago, but which is now out of print. But I was able to rustle up some copies. And it's Galatians, A New Kind of Freedom Defended. It's by Jeff Cavins and Gail Summers. All right, and... Um, so they're both available as supplies last, and um, I hope you'll get that. Other than that, bring yourself prayerfully prepared. I hope with a, a study Bible that you give yourself permission to write in and, and use more than just the book of Galatians, uh, an entire Bible, because as usual, we will refer to a lot of other scriptures. The best commentary on scripture is scripture, right? Okay. Before we get into the actual text of Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, it's very important to know the context. And in this case, that includes a lot of the life of Paul. Because Paul's theology comes from his lived experience. What he learned directly in the school of the Holy Spirit, the school of hard knocks, the school of prayer. Uh, he didn't sit down at any human being's feet and, and, and learn the lesson. He says he was taught directly by revelation of Jesus Christ. And sometimes after a lot of perseverance and sweat and tears. So we have to know who he was and what the situation of his life was that prompted him to write this letter. Okay? It's considered one of the four great letters of Paul. Along with Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians. Those are the four biggest. I guess that's why they're called the greatest. They also have a more comprehensive summary of his theology than some of the other letters. Romans is really his opus. Romans is unique in a lot of ways because Paul in one place said, I never went to any church that had been founded by another person. Romans was the exception, so it was important. And when we studied Romans, we talked about why he felt it was important enough to make the exception. All the other letters that he wrote were written to churches that he had already founded and spent time in. They had heard him preaching already. So he's writing back to them with one or two questions in mind. When he wrote to the Romans, they had never heard him preach. 
So he wanted a more comprehensive view of the version of the gospel he was teaching and all of the things he was bringing to it by his own revelation and his own understanding of things about grace and save salvation by faith and the, the ontic change that is the, the fundamental change of nature by which we are saved, divine sonship, being rebirthed into God. And, and, but something that was very important to him, that is, and all those are in Galatians too, but one that was very important to him was this idea that the church of Jesus Christ, the invitation to be in the family of God is for everybody. For everybody. You may think, so what? And we understand that. But that was not the assumption in the very early days of the church. It was there, but somehow they were missing the nuance of what was in the Old Testament, what Jesus had done, what their own experience had been. And they were preaching only to the Jews, thinking it was only for the Jews. And I'm talking about the apostles were doing that. Right? Paul, who is not one of the twelve apostles, who was a persecutor of the Christians and became a convert, it became clear to him that it was for everyone. And it's by his efforts, his preaching, his yielding to the Holy Spirit to accept some very hard persecution, that he put that forward and it became the accepted fundamental truth of the universal church. We call ourselves Catholic, which means universal. It's for everyone. So in a special way, Paul, and especially the letter to the Galatians, should be a treasure of ours unless you happen to be of Jewish heritage because the rest of us otherwise wouldn't be here. All right? When Paul says, once you were a people of darkness with no hope, now you are a people of light called to be God's own. That's us. Right? Paul knew that. He believed it to be a fundamentally important part of the gospel. In this gospel, he's going to be railing against people who disagreed with him and who were, in his mind, contaminating the minds and the hearts of the believers who he considered his spiritual children. He's writing this on his third missionary journey, back to the churches he had founded on his second missionary journey, the churches of Galatia, which is a Roman province of Asia Minor, which is now called Turkey. All right. His third missionary journey, now he's gone over to Macedonia and Greece, but he gets a message that what he calls the Judaizers have come in and are going to the churches that he had founded and convincing them that they're not really Christians. What they thought, and they were Christians now. The Judaizers are Christians. These were not the Jewish opponents of Christianity. These were Christians, either Jews who had become Christians or Gentiles who had become Christians who had already accepted that they had to first become Jews. And what they believed that to be an authentic Jew, you had to be, I mean, authentic, authentic Christian, you had to be a Jew or become a Jew, beginning with circumcision. But also following with the dietary laws, you know, the rules about the Sabbath, the Levitical priesthood, animal sacrifices, temple worship, all the rest of it. Paul was saying, no. That's the old wineskin that held the old wine. The new wineskin that contains the new wine does away with that. Those were necessary for the age of preparation. In the age of Christ, in the age of the new covenant, we now have new sacraments to replace those old traditions. And he didn't just consider it a difference of opinion. You could take it or leave it. He considered it no. He says, if you succumb to that, you'll say in one place, if you have yourself circumcised, there's no hope for you. He's very passionate. So that's another thing about this letter. He's very reasoned in his letters to the Romans especially. He's a polished theologian, right? But he is a mad papa in Galatians. And he's writing and he's mad at the people that are believing this false gospel. And he's livid against these people that he considers to be false prophets teaching this heresy and contaminating his spiritual children. That's what's in store here, okay? And it'll come out very clearly. Paul. Paul was born... Paul had two names. Why did he have two names? Because he was a Roman citizen as well as a Jew. His Roman name was Paul or Paulos. 
His Hebrew name was Saul or Shaul. Okay? He was born in Tarsus in Cilicia. Back then that was the region that as you're moving from Syria uh, into Turkey, that, that would be the, the big bend there. And that's Cilicia. And Tarsus is there. And it was a Roman colony. And Paul was very unique in many ways and very different from the apostles. How? He had a Jewish mother, so he was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. But he had a Roman Gentile father. That made him a Roman citizen. You, you were identified as who you were in the Jewish culture by who your mother is, in the Roman culture by who your father is. So that gave Paul a kind of a dual citizenship, right? Also, it gave, he was, he was uh, fluent in Greek, which was the lingua franca of the world, the Roman Empire, outside of whatever local dialect there might be, right? In Rome, they might have spoken a little Latin. They might have spoken a little Aramaic in, in Palestine, but the, the language of the world was Greek. We don't know how well the apostles or even Jesus actually spoke Greek because they weren't world travelers. They spent their life in Israel, right? probably spoke some. He probably had to. Like most places in the world, if you did any business at all, you need to speak a little English, right? English is the lingua franca of the business world around the globe. So, but, but it was Greek. But he was fluent in Greek. And, and experts that read his Greek said, no, he, he, he uh, had a very polished Greek. He also was educated in the Greek customs. So he was... A, he was uh, well versed with Aristotle and traditional uh, Greek philosophy. That's why, why when he gets to Athens he can stand in front at the Areopagus and discuss philosophy with the Athenians, right? But he was raised and educated primarily in Jerusalem as a Jew. Even more than a Jew than as a Pharisee and as a rabbi. Alright, so by the time he got grown and he was ready to begin his occupation he was very well versed in the Jewish scripture he was an expert he was actually taught by Gamaliel it was his teacher who is considered one of the greatest rabbis in Jewish history so he's one of the best students of the best rabbi he knew his stuff so he was uniquely positioned wasn't he well, to be sent out into the world he could travel freely as a Roman. He could speak Greek. He knew the customs. And, 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 and Galatia is very close to his hometown too, by the way. So he knew the region there he was going to. He knew how to get around. But he also was well-versed enough and had credentials enough that when he ran into the Jewish opponents of Christianity, he could argue with the best of them. So when their rabbis and teachers stood up and say, Paul, this Jesus is not the Messiah of our scriptures, he could say, Sit down, little man, and let me give you a lesson that's going to change your ever-loving mind, right? So he was uniquely placed to do all these things. But probably his greatest gift was his passion. Passionate. He was passionate when he was an enemy of the church, and he was a passionate when he was a proponent of the church. And that passion propelled him sometimes to lose his temper, that's true, but also to get up when the licks were down and just never give up. I mean, he, he's a man, and he's, and he's a prophet, he was a visionary, and he was absolutely convinced after his conversion experience of who Jesus was and what he was supposed to do with the rest of his life. Missy? Um, uh, and adding to all that, can I ask you why we sometimes refer to Paul as a tent maker? Right, well, in the tradition of the rabbis, you also had a secular occupation. Okay. And his was as a tent maker. I think that meant you could make all kinds of leather things. Um, tent, but probably belts and I don't know what else. Uh, but yes, he's identified as a tent maker. We know a lot about Paul. We know more about Paul than we know about Peter or John or Luke or almost anybody except maybe Jesus because he's spoken about so much in the book of Acts and also you know, tidbits he gives in his writings. And he wrote most of the New Testament, uh, about, I don't know, three-fourths of it. 
right? If you consider all of his letters. Now, he didn't write the most in terms of words. Who wrote the most words? Do you know that? That'd be Luke. Because Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, which is big. And then Acts, which is Luke 2, picks up the story right after the end of the Gospel. That's why they're right there together. You almost don't even need to have a divider there, right? But between Luke and Acts, that's more words than all of Paul's letter together, even though it's only two works, okay? Were all these letters from prison? No. Okay. They were not all from prison. His captivity letters were the last ones he wrote when he was in prison in Rome and he wrote those back primarily to the churches that he then founded in Greece. Okay. Corinth and Philippi, those, okay? But the first batch of churches that he founded were in Asia Minor or Turkey or what he and the Romans called Galatia. So now on his third journey he's writing to them. So that's where we are. Paul... Most all the commentaries until recently that I've read said that Paul was probably 10 years younger than Jesus. If you just want to place him. I'm not sure I believe that anymore. I, wrote, I read a book recently called Jesus and Paul Parallel Lives by Jerome Murphy O'Connor. I think it's by Tan. No, Liturgical Press. And he puts a pretty plausible argument out there that he was probably much closer to Jesus' age. And as I started thinking about it, for other reasons that's beyond the scope right here, that kind of made sense to me. Um, I'm thinking now, he was a, a couple of years. Let's split the difference and say he's five years younger than Jesus, okay? Beginning his official ministry, which would have been their tradition, at about the age 30. So when Paul shows up as a persecutor of the Jews, he remember, he, he himself said, I was there when Stephen was stoned to death. I was watching the garments of those that murdered him. I was complicit with it. And then he became a very fanatical persecutor of the Christians. He was given letters by the, by the high priest to go to Damascus and arrest Christians even there. And it's on the way there he had his conversion experience. So he must have been around 30 then. He was beheaded in 67 AD. We know that with a lot of certainty. So that means he had a pretty illustrious ministry career of about 30, 35 years, okay? 30, 35 years. You can take that or leave it. I can't really prove it. No one can. But that's, um, except for the end, the beginning we're not all as uncertain of. But we know that he was converted dramatically on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians and bring them back and to arrest Jews. Now, this is still where they, all the Christians were still Jews. He had letters to go arrest Jews who had become Christians because in his mind, in the high priest's mind, in the Sanhedrin minds, they were quislings, they were turncoats, they were traitors, right? They were heretics. This is a punishable crime. They took their faith very seriously. And they didn't want you out there calling yourself a Jew and preaching this heresy to other Jews. They wanted to round you up and bring you back because we might thinking, well, how can a religious figure in this country have the authority to send police and arrest people in another country and bring them back so that he could hold court over them. He said, it was a different day. <laughs> it was a different attitude. All right, This was a theocracy, even though they were under the Roman boot. And the high priest carried a lot of political power, military power too, at least police power. Right? Could only do what the Romans would allow them, but in these matters, the Romans didn't care that much. They didn't care that much. As long as you paid your taxes and didn't cause too much trouble to the Romans. You could do what you wanted to to each other. So anyway, he's on the way to Damascus. And he is struck blind. And he hears Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know the story, right? Maybe you've seen the painting. The most famous of which is Caravaggio, right? And... and uh, this is where Paul, Caravaggio is the one that makes, however he does it, I don't know, he's a genius, but the, the painting, is the background is usually dark. And then the figures are in the front, and they're big, and he makes them look like there's, there's beams of light on them. And in his most famous painting of Saul, Paul's conversion, he's laying on the ground, looking up with his beam of light on him, and his horse is there, looking at him, and another, another guy that acts like he doesn't even notice, but the horse notices, right? Yeah. 
That painting is in uh, Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome, right in a small chapel. And on the other side of it is the crucifixion of St. Peter, his other masterpiece. Both of those are the second version. The first version that he was commissioned to do of those two were not accepted. These are the second versions. They were accepted. The first versions, I think, are in the Vatican Museum. But if you ever privileged to go to Rome, go to Santa Maria del Popolo, and there's one little chapel you can see these masterpieces of Caravaggio. By the way, Caravaggio was in Rome and was influenced a lot by Philip Neri around the year 1600. Those of you that were here last week when we finished up our DVD series on true reformers, the last one we did was St. Philip Neri. Yes. Remember the, the, the parish priest in Rome that converted so many? Uh, yeah, well, Caravaggio heard him and his his understanding, his faith was influenced by Philip Neri. Kind of all of these circles being tied together, right? So that's that. By the way, in the first version of the painting by Caravaggio, Saul is an old, older man with a long beard and no shirt. He looks more like a rabbi. In the first one, he's a young man looking like he's in his 20s, he's got a sword and kind of a military vest on. So I, I don't know if the guy that commissioned it just didn't like the old Paul, said, oh, I wanted to be a young warrior. Or maybe he was also debating was his age and just decided to do one of each. <laughs> but he looks very different in these two paintings, right? Also, by the way, I know this is an aside, in both of those paintings there's a horse. Yes. As if when it says he was struck to the ground, he was, struck, he was knocked off his horse. That's not in the scriptures. In the scriptures, there's no horse. So he's knocked down, but, but for everywhere around the world, when the story is told, everyone pictures him being knocked over off a horse because of Caravaggio. Right? So that's that. So he, he's told to go into Damascus and to wait instructions, basically. And a Christian there named Ananias, sort of an unsung hero, but very important to our story, was in prayer and he was told, Saul, has, I've just called Saul, you need to go to him and pray for him, he'll be healed of his blindness and then baptize him. And Ananias says, there's got to be a mistake here, right? This guy came to arrest me and my whole family. And he, he says, no, go do it. Ananias, God bless him, he did it. And he said, Saul, my brother, the Lord has told me to come pray for you. And he did, he was healed, and he said, What's the delay? Let's baptize you, man. And he baptized him, and Saul was totally changed. Though it took a long time for him to become the version of Paul that we know, we hear about in Galatians. And it wasn't instantaneous. He started telling everyone there in Damascus that Jesus was the Messiah of Jewish prophecy. And it stirred up quite a bit of controversy. Number one, the Christians were still afraid of him. The Jews were mad that he was doing this. And so the Christians had to smuggle him out of town for his own protection. This is where they lower him down in a basket from a window on the city wall, right? It says he goes, he said later in another place, from there I went out to the desert of Arabia. And certainly he meant the desert area of Syria, where ISIS set up headquarters in recent history. Probably where Raqqa and some of those places that we hear about, that desert area of eastern Syria is probably where he went. We don't know how long he stayed. M months? Years? We don't know. He says from there he made a brief visit to Rome to converse with Peter. Just a brief visit. Peter got his blessing and he, uh, but when the Jews found out he was there a lot of trouble broke out and so the Christian church decided to send him back to Tarsus Saul, you're okay. You're forgiven. Don't worry about it. Don't get yourself killed over this thing. We'll take it from here. They send him back to Tarsus just to put him on ice, really. Because everywhere he went, you know, riots were breaking out. So we don't need this kind of trouble, right? And he stayed there for a while. Still, I'm sure, in prayer. Still in study. Still looking at these scriptures that he had been steeped in all his life, but looking at them now with the light of the Holy Spirit seeing things he had missed before, and putting together in a coherent way the arguments that he would present later on, not knowing that he, if he would ever have the chance to do that. But then another beautiful uh, hero 
unsung hero in the faith named Barnabas comes around. The, the, the church is flourishing in Antioch, Antioch of Syria. After, after a persecution broke out in Jerusalem and a lot of the Jewish Christians went to Antioch. And it broke out there and the church is doing real well. The, the apostles in Jerusalem heard about it so they send Barnabas there. He's very pleased at what's going on but he decides to go get Paul and bring him to Antioch. right? And he does. So they become friends. They have a fallen out a little later on but they, they figure it out. Yes sir? I was seeing Syria at the tip of Syria was in Antioch and in this map that you're given in this book also there's an Antioch there. It's called, that's Antioch in Pisidia, and, it, and it's mentioned. So there's two Antiochs, but the, the the first one where they're first called Christians is Antioch in Syria. That's the one closer down the Big Bend, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. There, there is one. All right. So Barnabas gets him. The church decides to send them out by word of prophecy on an evangelical mission, and this is really where it all starts his first evangelical missionary journey. And this is where he begins to see the Gentiles coming to the faith. This is where he begins to understand when Jesus says, I'm going to send you out to the Gentiles, that what it meant. This is where he began to be convinced that the Gentiles did not have to become Jews. This is where this is all... Uh, germinating in his soul, okay? Because up to then, let me just give you a couple more little background things. For instance, in Acts 11, 19, it says, Those who had scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, but they proclaimed the message only to Jews. That's what they were doing. That's what they were convinced of. Now, by the way, we don't exactly know in the chronology of time where this happened, but in the chronology of the narrative of Luke in Acts, Paul, Peter has an experience that actually predates Paul's experience with the Gentiles. All right? And that's Cornelius. It's mentioned in Acts 10. All right? I know you're very familiar with it. For some reason, it comes up pretty often with us, but I'm going to bring it up, go over it again. Paul is in Lystra? No, Jaffa. Doesn't matter. Pa Peter, 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 is, and, he's, and he's had a uh, lunch. He's taking, he's having prayers, and he goes to sleep. And he has a vision, a trance sort of thing. And, and God from heaven lowers down a blanket, and in it are the unclean animals that Jews are not supposed to eat. The things that are outlawed by the kosher law. And he hears a voice say, kill and eat. And he said, no. I'm a good Jew, I'll never do that. It goes up, comes down, same thing, same request with the same answer. Third time it comes down, it says, kill and eat. And he says, no. I am a good Jew. I don't do that. And then it says, what I have called clean, you shall not call unclean. And then he's told some men are coming to the house to ask for you to accompany them back to Caesarea Maritime, which was a, the Jewish military town, okay? Just up the coast from Jaffa. And he says, go with them. All right, well, he wakes up. <laughs> Peter here? Cornelius sent us, a Roman centurion, to ask him to come and tell us about Jesus because he's heard things He's, he's prompted in faith to agree with them. He wants to hear the gospel. Peter goes. Right? As he's preaching, the Holy Ghost gets all over him. Right? So, as he, when he, so he baptizes them. Gentiles. He didn't make them get circumcised first. None of that. He just baptized them. When he got back, the other apostles and believers kind of said, what are you doing, man? And he said, look, the Holy Spirit got on them like he did on us at Pentecost. So I can imagine what that meant. Tongues of fire, speaking in tongues, the place rocking, a great wind. I don't know, but he said, like he did. He said, who was I to withhold baptism? <coughs> Holy Spirit wanted them, so I couldn't say we didn't. So I baptized them, right? But that didn't change their praxis at that point. Because what I just told you, they still only preached to the Jews. That's in chapter 11. 
So in Luke's narrative chronology, that happened, and he wanted us to know that the, the, the revelation of, of Jesus being available to the Gentiles was made to Peter first. That's probably important. Paul, in other words, didn't own it. Paul's going to be the one to take the big yellow highlighter and, and go like this. But when they come, it comes to a big church council to settle the question, Peter's going to make the decision in Paul's favor, and it's going to be because he remembers this event and other things too. As they start, in the light of the Holy Spirit, for instance, start thinking back on, on the ministry of Jesus, let alone Old Testament prophecies about it. But on Jesus, we don't know what they did with it when the Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile, came to him. And he healed her. Remember? Uh, or, or, or when the, the Gentiles from Phoenicia came and he let them in because they too wanted to hear the gospel. Or when he fed the 7,000, not the 5,000 in Galilee, but the 7,000 on the five, far side of the Jordan. That's Gentile country. And he did a breaking of the bread and the feeding of the multitude amongst Gentiles. Or how about the Gadarene demoniac? He's not a Jewish man. He healed him, right? Delivered him. So he was going outside of Israel proper. He was extending to even the goim, the dogs. And remember the woman said, he said, it's not right I give to the dogs what was meant for the children. She says, even the dogs get the scraps. It's very, very interesting language because the, the, the Jewish word for Gentiles is the same as it was for dogs, and that's goim. And she said, but even the dogs get the scraps. And he said, Woman, your faith has healed you, right? For your humility, yes, I'm healing you, and more is to come, right? So, so they had those experiences, those lived experiences too, but it had not penetrated into their consciousness. It had not been able to tear down their prejudice. I don't mean that in a, to a bad of a way, because they had been brought up to believe this, right? And even though some evidence that they should rethink it had been in front of them, it didn't become explicit until Paul. Paul's the one that had the guts to say, and of course he had the advantage of having a direct revelation of Jesus, said, this is what I want. Uh, but he was convinced in it. And he might have said, you better go tell the apostles. They kind of outranked me, you know. He didn't, he didn't hesitate at all. All right. Maybe so. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me spin ahead now on this first mission, probably around 48 AD. And Barnabas and Paul are in Antioch and they're being sent out and they're having trouble. Uh, All right. They preach. Where do we go? They passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, and they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news was received by great satisfaction by the brothers in Antioch. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and by the apostles there. They gave an account of everything they had done. But when they gave that account, that's when they... We're run out of town, right? Okay. Let me see if I can find where I actually want to be here. Chapter 16. Now Paul and Barnabas, three years later. He's travel they travel through Syria and Cilicia. And they go from there to Derbe, then on to Lystra. And there was a disciple named Timothy who they converted, whose mother was Jewish. And he became a believer, but his father was Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. But as they visited one town after another, they passed on the decisions reached by the apostles with instructions to observe them. Am I still lost here? Yes, 13 is where I want to be. Thank you. Around verse 44. I was reading of events past this one, this 
this primordial important one that I wanted to get to. So Paul and Barnabas are out. They're having trouble. And it says they're having success amongst some. But the next Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of God. And when they saw the crowds, the Jews, filled with jealousy, used blasphemies to contradict everything Paul said. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out fearlessly. This is what I was trying to get to. This is almost the Magna Carta for Gentile Christians. We had come to proclaim the word of God to you first. But since you have rejected it, since you do not think yourselves worthy of eternal life, here and now we turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord commanded us to do. When he said, and he quotes Isaiah, I have made you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach the remotest parts of the earth. It made the Gentiles very happy to hear this. And they gave thanks to the Lord. And all who were destined for eternal life became believers. But a terrible persecution broke out against them, against the Jews. Shortly after this is where he will be stoned, they think, to death. Drug out of the town because they think he's dead. And just thrown away. When the believers came to get his poor beat up carcass and bury it, he stood up and went on to the city, right? Now, was that a resurrection or just a resuscitation? I don't know. But later on in another place, Paul's going to talk about a time when he was caught up into heaven and saw things that he can't even utter in human language. You know, and you say, well, when did that happen? And some people say, well, maybe it was here. Maybe he did have one of those, I died and God said, I'm not done with you back and, and kicked you back, right? Maybe that was here. But, I mean, he got, he, this is the first of many times he got the pudding kicked out of him. He gets scourged, he gets jailed, he gets shipwrecked. I mean, that's why I said the passion of Paul, the courage of Paul is not to be underestimated. Because the way they stoned you, you know, I mean, you were kind of a little ravine or a ditch or something, and you were down in it, and your accuser threw the biggest stone, the biggest rock, and the attempt was to try to break your back so that you couldn't run or move, and everyone else just pelted you until you were basically buried. Imagine the broken bones and the bruises and the lacerations, the internal injuries. That what a way to go, you know. So, but it didn't, it didn't finish him off. Now he says later on when he's describing that vision that he had, that this was a great gift of God, but to keep me humble, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. Did that result? Did he have some neurological injury from this stoning? We don't know. I mean, it's conjecture, possible, probably plausible. But you take a whooping like that and, I don't know, do you end up with a limp? Do you end up with a chronic sciatic nerve? Do you have a little brain damage? Do you have a speech impediment? All of that, certainly. Is your sight injured? More. Can you hear, are you half deaf? We don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. But if it resulted from this, it would be very understandable why. Right. And God gave me life again to allow me to retain that to keep me humble. That's what he said. Okay. Questions? I'm sorry I got confused there for a minute. All right. This leads us up to an extremely important event in the history of the church. The first great church council. Because Paul now begins to openly preach conversion available to the Gentiles. Right? They're no longer aberrations. And they're coming in in great droves. While his opponents, the ones that thought they had to first become Jews, became livid. And, and it became a great controversy. A great controversy. A schism. The church was barely 10 years old and it was about to split into a Jewish Christian church and a Gentile Christian church. Paul had the savvy to know that if I don't have the blessings on this from the apostles themselves, it's not going to go anywhere. Even though I'm convinced it's truth. I've got to trust God that he knows what he's doing. So he travels to Jerusalem. And the apostles that are there with Peter present, John, it says James, I don't want to argue with anybody, I don't think it's James the Apostle, I think it's James the cousin of Jesus who became the first bishop of Jerusalem. I don't want to fight about it. But, but he's a bigwig, he's a bigwig, the bishop of Jerusalem for heaven's sakes. And the, and the Jews held him in great respect, Josephus said everybody held him in great respect. There was, he was eventually martyred. So they convene a council and there's Paul against everyone else. Paul, this upstart convert, 
Paul, who had not been an apostle. We don't know if Paul ever met and spoke to Jesus. Maybe. But Jesus wasn't in Jerusalem that long, you know. If Paul spent all his time, when Jesus came to Jerusalem on Ascension Sunday, he was dead by the next Friday. So he didn't spend that much time there. We don't know if they ever even met. But So here's Paul. And, and we who knew Jesus, who ate with him, walked with him, you know, were in his presence, heard his teachings and everything, we're all of one mind on this question. And here's Paul with this absurd new idea. But you know, when Jesus established the church, and I will give you the Holy Spirit, who will lead and guide you into all truth. Right? There's no exceptions there. So this Vatican Council was to invoke the Holy Spirit and to, okay, let's find out what God wants. And after everybody for hours had debated and presented their points of view, Peter speaks up. He says, you know what? I'm now understanding the Cornelius thing. I'm getting it. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Paul is right. Paul is right. This is bigger than we ever thought it was. This is for everyone, right? So Paul, go with our blessings. Go with letters from us. And tell the Jewish converts, wherever you go, they're okay in our eyes. Okay? Big, momentous, climactic moment in the history of theological ideas. In the history of, of salvation history. Of, of, of the history of revelation. Of the history of ideas. This was spectacular and important. Okay? It opened the door for the conversion of the world, right? However, his opponents did not go away. Those that he calls were of the party of James, even though James himself had agreed with Peter, because Peter said it. Um, and that shows the primacy of Peter, by the way, doesn't it? Um, those that had been in his party didn't necessarily want to buy into Peter's decision. And so they still took it upon themselves to save the church from Peter and his errors. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> and to go out and preach something other than the true church under the vicar of Christ was teaching. And, and they, they were what Paul called the Judaizers. And what they were specifically saying was, look, Paul is just weak. Paul is just sucking up. Paul was just trying to give you a watered-down version of the truth because he knew it would get more converts. Because, of course, if you're saying, you have to be baptized and circumcised, by the way, I might cut down the number of people who are walking forward. No pun intended. Right? So they're saying that's the reason he says that. He doesn't want you to have to worry about kosher laws and all the rest of that stuff because he knows it's harder, but the truth is hard. And you're not authentic Christians unless you also do that. Everyone believes this. It's, I mean, the, the old covenant was supposed to be perpetual. When God told Abraham, circumcise your offspring, and this is a perpetual commandment. So who is Paul to say, no more? Right? So they were following him and having great success. And evidently they were large in numbers and pretty persuasive. And, and they became the primary persecutors of Paul, really. Fellow Christians that had a stinking idea that he considered to be heretical. I mean, his, his opponents were really not the Romans for the longest time. They ended up executing him at the end of his life, but they weren't the ones that he ran in trouble with. It was first the Jews, and then it was the Judaizers. Question? Oh, the, the controversies. Of, yeah, the church still has plenty of controversies, right? I, I will. Okay. Right. Well, we still have controversies, of course. But the Catholic, Catholic, well, the, the Catholic belief is that the promise that Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the church that would allow us in times of absolute catastrophe to find the right way. Well, that only works if everyone's bound to the decision that comes from that council, right? When the Pope speaks ex cathedra, which doesn't happen very often. The Popes are quite comfortable with allowing 
controversy and debate and difference of opinions and they're very slow to condemn people for their opinions feeling that in time you know a consensus will be arrived at there's nothing wrong with people having debates and differences of opinion but some but being sincere doesn't is not necessarily enough you can be sincerely wrong and at some point if it's a big enough crisis your wrongness that it's actually going to rupture the church is unity then it's time to speak ex cathedra on that issue and make a dogmatic pronouncement but when you get to where you have a church that does not believe that if there is no uh, uh, what do we call our highest court? Yeah. Supreme, court. Supreme Court. If there is no Supreme Court, then the, the differing judgments of lower courts cannot do anything except agree to disagree. You know, and maybe come to blows over it. Right? So, and that's why, of course, that, that's exactly what we've seen happen. That one of the results of the Protestant Reformation, the only thing they could agree on really is that we're not Catholic anymore and the Pope has no authority. So when it came to doctrinal dogmatic differences, they couldn't settle them and you just have division after division after division. Sometimes with swords and clubs in, involved, right? But controversies certainly have always abounded and uh, they continue to abound. And, sometimes, and a lot of times it, 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 just, it just evolves in time as to be the common understanding of everyone. It's not necessary to have a church council about it. Yeah. The way the first Jewish John James they, they were taught. Now we have the Catholic Church in the coming of Martin Luther, we are accused of being taught. How can we put it together? We're accused of being what, George? I'm sorry. Too much strict. Too strict? Too strict, like you know, Martin Luther when he came, he changed the way you know believe. Yeah, he changed a few fundamental things, not as much as you find out there now. Uh, of course, Martin Luther would denounce as heretics most of the theology that's people that consider him the patron saint of truth, a great liberator, you know, or something like that. But as, as you saw when we looked at great reformers, the church needed reform in that day, as it does now, right? The difference is whether you allow God to do it or you get out of the get off the reservation as they say right so being too strict it's true we live in a time that freedom is defined as being able to do whatever I want and no one has the right or superior opinion to tell me what is right and what is wrong that's considered to be almost the greatest sin of a secular society right for you to insist that something is right that I call wrong or something is wrong that I call right but we believe that there is objective truth not defined by what I think but what, God, but what God says. And it's not all easy. But that it is all a gift. That the truth that we have, even if it's perceived as strict by some, restricts their freedom, but their freedom, it's their freedom to destroy themselves, right? The rules that we have are to protect our freedom to live as free and abundant people in the light, right? I've said before, you could consider... Uh, uh, a rail on a mountain road as a restriction to your freedom. You might complain that it's just there to keep me on the road. What if I want to drive beyond the boundary of the road? Well, you say, well, I guess you can, but it's not very bright. You know, you would understand that the consequences of that are rather calamitous. There's a thousand foot drop right there. You might actually thank whoever put that rail up, right? Because if you're not paying attention, you bump that rail, it kept you from being destroyed. So it's just the way you look at it, right? But if you think is having the right to do whatever you want and ref refuse the idea that there is anything like objective right and wrong that has demands of our adherence to it, to avoid these because they're bad, to to gravitate towards these because they're good, you say that's just subjective. Well, that, that is the heresy of the modern world. That is the heresy of the modern, modern world. Right. Well, St. Augustine, I actually quote him in the homily I gave today. He said, love and then do as you will. But he had a little different something in mind there. He didn't... <laughs> he didn't... <laughs> but yes, right. 
But we're all about freedom, right? It's exactly it. We're Christians, we're gospel people because we want to be free. But the paradox is that we get more and more free by submitting ourselves deeper and deeper to the ways of God. You understand? Yes. Likewise, the paradox is that we grow in abundance. We grow richer in every way the more we give away all that we have to the will of God and to the service of others. It's a, it doesn't make sense in the eyes of the world. It's something that only a mind informed by faith can understand. A heart motivated by the love of God can understand. It's what grace allows us to believe because we trust the one that said it. It says, if you want to live forever, die to yourself. If you want to be rich, become poor in the ways of the world. If you want to own everything, give everything away. That does not make sense to a modern rational mind who's so earthbound that they can't grasp the super logical genius of God. But that's the gospel, and we'll preach it whether it's easy or it's hard. It's the truth that Christ passed on to us and told us to pass on until there's no need to do it anymore. And that's what we'll do by the grace of God. We are free to let our body go wherever he wants, which we just get stuck being slaves for sin. We are slaves for our sin, and he's freeing us up. That's right. From being slaves for well, he says there's another place the way to stop being a slave to sin is become a slave of God. But it's not equal opposites. It's not just another version of the same thing. The only way to get free of the slavery of sin is to become a slave to God. To be sold out to His will. And the more we do that, the more free we become. The name of this study is Galatians, A New Kind of Freedom Defended. It's all about that. They get what we're talking about. It's what Paul was talking about. It's in here we're going to hear in a few weeks a, a, a conclusion of Paul that changes the world. Now in Christ, there is no slave and free, Jew and Greek, male and female, rich and poor. It's not just for Gentiles. He's saying it's for every human being to become reborn as a child of God and in that share a dignity that's beyond anything we can have in our human pedigree that that is part of the gift that we have here. And that we then live in a privileged position in creation with prerogatives as children of God to live in a power called grace that we could never know before with a destiny and a reward that is an inheritance for children that we can't even imagine on this side of heaven as John says in 1 John. Pa Paul's going to get to all that. But that 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 also contains a new anthropology. A Christian anthropology. Anthropology is what is a human? What is a human, right? He's redefining it. In the Christian mind, a human being is a, is a creature of dignity, but it's equal amongst all human beings. And, and if you play that out in all of its ramifications, all of the ideas that had dominated in the world before that said, if you're not from my country, or you don't speak my language, or you're not of my race, or you're not of my social class, I have every right to do to you, to take from you what I want. It's morally okay. We can invade this country. Why? Because we got more weapons than they do now. We'll go take what they have and bring it back, make them slaves, take all their stuff, and it's good. It's the way it's done, right? The patristic society thought nothing about treat treating women like possessions. You know, before it got reversed the other way? No, no. <laughs> they thought nothing about it. The idea that there should be something called democracy, where all the people choose the leaders, not just a select small class, or maybe just not in one family who becomes a dictator, or, or a small group of senators, or the rich landowners. You know, it grew in its, in its application. And then it was all men, and then it was all, all white men, then it was all men, then it was all men and women. You know, it was this idea of democracy, but it all grew from this idea 
everyone has an equal dignity. No one has the right to impose their will and do injustice on someone else because they're not in your group. That's Paul's idea. It's God's idea, Paul putting it down on paper. And as that got into the, the psyche and the consciousness of people through the centuries and deeper, deeper, and then began to show out in our laws and in our policies, that's the reason we see wonderful things like abolition of slavery and women's rights and children's rights and democracy. That's the reason it's there. In the history of ideas, that is a, a whole new dawning. It didn't exist in the world before Paul. Okay? Okay. I think we're at a pretty good point to wrap up our contextual introduction. <laughs> so that maybe next week when we start to read from Galatians and Paul says something that would otherwise be confusing, we can understand why he said that. That's the reason we do all this, right? You know, because if, if we know what's ahead a little bit when we encounter it, we can understand it and not be knocked off our horses. Okay? So I hope, I, hope, I hope you're tuned into that now. You'll go ahead and read at least the first chapter of Galatians. And, and if you bought one of the commentaries, the commentary that goes with it, and then you should be well equipped and dangerous and ready <laughs> for next week. Okay? And I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all, all for coming, and please bring your friends too. All right, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. St. Paul, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.